continuing with the vertical integration session for undergraduate students today we are discussing a very very relevant topic both in terms of uh, clinical practice and academics that is tuberculosis so for this we have uh, eminent faculty members from various uh, departments uh, uh, which which deal with uh, tuberculosis so we have uh, starting uh, starting from my immediate right we have uh, dr arsena from the department of uh, pathology she is an associate professor uh, dr chinnu from the department of microbiology uh, dr ann from the department of uh, uh, general medicine and dr vishnu from the department of community medicine i'll start the session with a question to dr vishnu uh, dr vishnu can you uh, describe on the epidemiology of tuberculosis and also uh, discuss tb in, from a public health perspective Sure, sir. Thank yeah. you. So, uh, tuberculosis, as we all know, is an infectious agent. Uh, I mean, disease caused by uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, primarily, it affects the lungs, and we call it as uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. And it also affects certain other organs, uh, and we call it as extra pulmonary uh, tuberculosis. Now, if you look at the epidemiology part, um, even though we have like a lot of newer medications and all those things, still tuberculosis remains a major public health crisis even right now at this mm -hmm. age. So, if you look at the statistics, uh, like uh, last year we had around, globally we had around some 10.5 million people infected with tuberculosis, out of which around 1.3 million people died. Mm -hmm. And uh, even in India, the incidence rate was around 193 per 1 lakh population, which is quite huge. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you, and, and if you look at the pattern of how the disease is being distributed, most of the cases are being clustered around the Southeast Asian region. Mm -hmm. And uh, India happens to be one of the major countries with a huge burden. We account for almost 26% of the total cases worldwide, burden, which is yeah. again a problem for us. Now, why is this happening? Again, there are multiple reasons for it. Um, so, we always quite, we, I mean, from a public health point of view, what I would like to tell in this context is like, all, it has always been said like tuberculosis is a disease of the poor and all those things. So, mm -hmm. it majorly affects, uh, you know, people coming from the lower socioeconomic status. So, that is a major problem for us. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the age distribution of tuberculosis, uh, maybe except, I mean, in most of the states, it's like it affects people from the younger age group, like 15 mm -hmm. to 30 years. Mm -hmm. And except maybe in like some states like Kerala, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, where even the older people are most commonly affected. But in general, we talk about the, we, we are looking about the younger age group usually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The problem is like these, when it affects the younger age group, it, it becomes a mo major socioeconomic problem further. Why? Because, uh, you know, it is like the productive age group which is being affected yeah. here. And now the issue is like, uh, once you get infected with TB, it's like three to four months for you to recuperate from the disease. So then that many months of loss of job, loss of income, so that could be a problem. And if you're struggling with poverty, then your condition is going to be even more worse. Mm -hmm. So that is a issue over here. So uh, like the common determinants, like normally what we talk about, like poor housing standards and poor, uh, you know, like uh, sanitation, overcrowding, mm -hmm. all these issues play a major role. And so our target group might be like migrant, uh, laborers right now, people living in the slum areas, people living in the tribal areas, these are all people who are kind of we need to focus more on. Mm -hmm. So I think like if we need to bring down the disease incidence, it's it's not, we just, there's no point in looking at the medical management alone. We need to look at all these things and we need to take care of all these other factors also which plays a role in, you know, in, mm -hmm. in making India one of the highest uh, uh, countries with the highest number of cases on the mm -hmm. planet right now. So mm -hmm. I think we need to look up at all that. And then also one last point in this is regarding the accessibility to treatment. Okay. So we need to understand that um, uh, a patient infected with TB remains infective unless, you know, until he's being treated. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that is a major issue here. So we need to make sure that the, the last person living at the most remotest part of the country also is being taken into, uh, you know, the thing where he's being detected early and he's also being managed uh, properly To I think only then we can actually bring down this number uh, further in future at least thank you right so i think that that would have kind of uh, set the context for the further questions that the relevance of it especially in our country um, moving on to uh, uh, dr arsena can you elaborate on the pathogenesis of uh, primary and post primary disease in tuberculosis uh, first i'll explain some of the terminologies which are relevant in the discussion of pathogenesis so uh, first one is primary tuberculosis uh, prim progressive primary tuberculosis, secondary tuberculosis, progressive secondary tuberculosis, etc. These terminologies may not be relevant in the treatment uh, point of view, but they are relevant in uh, discussing the pathogenesis. So, primary tuberculosis is the one in which occurs in a patient who is not exposed to tuberculosis, and so the infection occurs exogenously. And at the time of primary tuberculosis, patient is mostly asymptomatic and some may go into latency. 
some can also progress which is known as progressive pulmonary tuberculosis and this presents as a acute pneumonic episode uh, whereas in secondary tuberculosis it is in a patient who is already sensitized to tuberculous ba or um, bacteria and at this point it may be an endogenous infection due to reactivation of the latent bacteria or it can be reinfection this reinfection occurs usually in uh, areas where there is high prevalence of tuberculosis and um, because the patient is already sensitized, the tissue response is rapid and this results in rapid uh, cavity formation in the lung. So this cavity uh, can erode in the airway and the patient will uh, produce infective sputum which is communicable to the other patients, other people. Uh, so that was about uh, secondary tuberculosis and this can also progress in the form of increased sputum production which can later become purulent. So these are the terminologies which are important in the pathogenesis of TB. And now I'll go on to the pathogenesis as such. So pathogenesis can be uh, divided into five headings mainly first one is entry of the organism into the macrophage second one is the uh, proliferation of the bacteria inside the macrophage third one is th1 t uh, helper uh, cells activation fourth one is activation of macrophage by this th1 t cell and um, killing of the bacteria and the fifth one is granuloma formation so uh, in uh, first one, the entry of the macro, uh, organism into the macrophage. This occurs by the presence of some uh, receptor on the macrophage like mannose binding lectin receptor and C3 receptor, uh, complement type 3 receptor on the macrophage which binds with similar uh, uh, target on the uh, organism and then it and, uh, it forms, uh, it is in, uh, in phagocytosed into the macrophage. After phagocytosis of the macrophage, next is proliferation inside the macrophage. This proliferation occurs because phagolysosome is not formed within the macrophage. The organism inhibits phagolysosome formation, so uh, the bacteria proliferates within the macrophage. After around three weeks of infection, the um, uh, T help, uh, uh, macrophage uh, produces in interleukin-12. In the presence of interleukin-12, the T cell gets activated into T helper cell, TH1 cell. This TH1 cell then produces interferon gamma. This interferon gamma production leads to maturation of phagolysosome. So now phagolysosome is matured and the killing of bacteria happens. So now we have uh, the b bacteria came inside the macrophage, um, the uh, replication happened. TH1 activation happened and TH1 in turn activates macrophage to um, uh, and it, uh, the maturation of phagolysosome happens and killing of bacteria happened. Meanwhile, the interferon produced by the um, macrophage also uh, helps in the interferon gamma helps in the maturation of uh, ep epithelial histiocytes are formed due to the differentiation of macrophage. These epithelial histiocytes aggregate to form granuloma. So the last step is granuloma formation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Dr. Chinnu. Dr. Chinnu, I'll kind of bundle three questions uh, together. Uh, can you tell something uh, about the basic uh, structure of the organism per se and also uh, the various tests of relevance in micro, I mean, tuberculosis and also is there something like a gold standard for Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is one micro. Uh, this is a bacteria, but it is not. It doesn't act like a routine, a uh, typical bacteria. So one of the important factor that you should remember is mycobacteria has a longer generation time. So what do you mean by generation time is the uh, is the ability or the time required for a bacteria to divide and form two daughter cells. For most of the bacteria, it takes around twenty to thirty minutes. Okay. But for TB bacilli, it takes around fifteen hours. And that is why uh, when we perform culture, it mm. takes some time, it takes a lot of time for right. the bacteria to grow on the culture media. Right. So now when we come to the diagnosis, depending on what site you are suspecting the disease, you send the sample accordingly. See right. most of the time it is sputum because you are suspecting pulmonary TB. Yeah. So we always ask for two sputum samples. One is the early morning sample. That is because when you are lying down, mm -hmm. uh, the pus can get accumulated and when you cough it out, you will 
you will get the pus from the deeper portion of the lungs okay. so they are supposed to contain more number of bacilli right. then another sample is a spot sample that is uh, that uh, any sample that in any time of the day you right. collect it you send these two samples right. then uh, what we do is if it is sputum sample it's uh, coming from the respiratory tract so the respiratory tract contain numerous common cell bacteria also okay so you need to remove them Mm-hmm. when you, before uh, doing the test okay so what we do is we do a concentration technique okay so mainly only for sputum samples we have we have the nalc and the uh, petrov's method okay so we do that so that the load of the bacilli will be concentrated mm-hmm. and then we perform the important microscopic test that is staining method Right. As you know, TB bacilli has a important comp- component on its cell wall, which is different from other bacteria, and that is mycolic acid. Okay. And it is this mycolic acid uh, will help the bacteria to resist strong decolorization, even using sulfuric acid. Mm-hmm. And sulfuric acid is what we use in acid fast stain. Okay. So that is why it is considered a special stain exclusively for acid fast bacilli, and TB right. is an acid fast bacilli. Right. So you uh, perform the acid fast stain. then you grade the smear you look for the number of tv bacilli in the smear okay. and when you report the uh, smear uh, report you say uh, acid fast bacilli seen along with the grading because okay. that will help you in treatment and then you have fluorescent staining also mm-hmm. again the fluorescent dyes will attach to these uh, cell wall and mm-hmm. then they will fluoresce if tb right. bacilli is present right. then you go for uh, the culture tb mm-hmm. culture is still considered the gold standard okay. even though they take a lot of time for a culture positivity but is still considered the gold standard okay uh, so here we use both solid and liquid medium so you have a selective medium for tb that is l jello and stein jensen medium mm-hmm. and then you have a liquid medium that is the midget automated midget system also okay. so shall i tell you the difference yeah, please, between yes yeah so the problem with lj is you inoculate the sample onto this medium uh, roughly around 6 to 8 weeks is required for the bacilli to grow on this medium okay so they will appear as rough tough and buff colored colonies which mm-hmm. is characteristically described for this bacteria mm-hmm. and then uh, the component of this media uh, of this medium is they have malachite green coagulated hen's egg etc mm-hmm. which will help you in a Uh, develop or nutrition provide the nutrition for the bacteria mm-hmm. then we have the automated midget system what is that is what is preferred nowadays okay. even in our lab we use that okay. so what we hear is it along it's a liquid system okay. so it's a liquid medium so you have the nutrients you add the nutrients required for the bacterial growth along with that you add an oxygen sensitive fluorescent uh, component into it so okay. what it does is So it's an automated system. So right. it, uh, it detects the fluorescence that is released when a uh, bacteria uh, divides. Okay. So if bacteria is present in the sample, it's going to use up the oxygen. Okay. So if, uh, once the oxygen depletes, this fluorescence dye will start getting released, mm-hmm. and the system will automatically uh, detect that and will get, send you a signal that mm-hmm. this has turned out to be positive. Okay. Then we take this uh, tube out and we perform the uh, Zeden stain and other uh, MPT sixty four uh, test, which mm-hmm. is specific for identifying whether it is Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex itself, mm-hmm. and then we say that the culture is positive. Okay. Now. since the duration is quite long we yeah. uh, clinicians prefer it if you can give the report early yeah. right so we have molecular methods for okay. that okay. so who has endorsed molecular methods especially for diagnosis of extra pulmonary tb where the bacillary load is very less okay. compared to pulmonary <coughs> tb okay. so we have different platforms available in molecular methods so molecular methods basically we use polymerase chain reaction for identifying the genome or a part of the gene of mm-hmm. the bacteria okay. so the different platforms that we have is the gene expert okay then you have truenet mm-hmm. so gene expert is a cartridge based system yeah so here you have a cartridge you add the specimen directly into the cartridge you okay. don't have to do any other thing mm-hmm. the machine and then you put the cartridge in the machine and the machine will perform all the steps of the pcr mm-hmm. and within 2 hours it will give you a result okay so that is the advantage of molecular method over culture then uh, within two hours in addition to uh, they will tell you whether there is presence or absence of the bacteria mm-hmm. as in addition to that they will tell you whether the bacteria has genes for rifampicin resistance also okay. which is an important drug for tb mm-hmm. treatment now truenet is similar platform okay. but here instead of a cartridge we use a chip okay so you add the specimen onto the chip 
okay. then you insert the chip in, into the machine mm -hmm. and then the machine will perform the steps and in the end it will tell you whether uh, TB bacilli is present or not and then it, it rifampicin resistance is present or not. Okay. So that is molecular method simple. Mm -hmm. Then you have line pro bacilli. So okay. line pro bacilli is also similar to PCR but here it can detect first line as well as second line TB resistant drugs. Okay. It will tell you whether first line as well as second line uh, drugs are resistant or not. Mm -hmm. But the problem is it takes around 2 to 3 days for the result. Uh, so then right. you have, uh, so these are the most common culture methods, so sorry, have, uh, molecular right, methods. Sorry, yeah. So you have told about the various tests, based upon the sample does the testing, uh, is there any anything which is going to change because initially you told that it's more for the sputum or respiratory samples. So yeah. when we are dealing with uh, say CSF or tissue. Yeah, CSF and tissue, CSF is considered a precious sample. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but still the diagnosis gold standard is still culture. Okay. But they say composite refract, uh, refraction in uh, standard CRS. So where you use culture positivity and you, have, you should have a strong clinical suspicion as mm -hmm. well as radiological findings or any other uh, findings if you have strong suspicion of that that will give you a better sensitivity okay. so we can similarly use csf tissue mm -hmm. and all these for molecular test also okay. uh, since the load is less in mm -hmm. these specimens we mm -hmm. would prefer we would advise you to go for these molecular methods so molecular methods it's uh, it's a very upcoming area in tb mm -hmm. So students tend to miss that in their answers also. <laughs> okay. So we always ask them to write at least a short a note on <laughs> molecular <laughs> also because everyone thinks it is just microscopy and culture. Okay, okay. So there is something beyond that also. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks Dr. Zeno. Uh, Dr. Ann, uh, so what are the key things to ask in history and also what are the basic uh, physical examination findings? and clinical features of a patient presenting with tuberculosis. We will uh, focus on pulmonary tuberculosis and maybe a short uh, quick word about extra pulmonary also. Yeah. So like all my colleagues have spoken about, you all understand that mycobacterium tuberculosis is a big burden, big problem in our country. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> the main complaint that a patient with tuberculosis will come with will be a persistent cough persisting for more than three weeks mm -hmm. with fever, fever with an evening rise of temperature classically mentioned with night sweats okay. and also history of significant weight loss. So when we talk about uh, tuberculosis, pulmonary tuberculosis is the most common uh, uh, common that we find and followed by there are other areas also which tuberculosis can involve in our body, mm -hmm. many organs and that comes under extra pulmonary tuberculosis. Right. So uh, depending on which organ is involved, the symptoms will be uh, different. Uh, so if it was uh, lymph nodes, the patient would have noticed a swelling with or without a discharging sinus with which the patient will be coming to us. Right. If it was related to the CNS, a uh, patient would have complaints of headache, mm -hmm. fever, vomiting, visual abnormality, seizures, altered sensorium. Mm -hmm. So if you are having ongoing fever, these symptoms, and if you are having a suspicion, suspicion, especially in India, we do keep tuberculosis one of a very important differentials in most cases. Uh, if it was um, um, uh, when we talk about uh, spine, sometimes patients will come with pain and lower back ache, back pain with a deformity. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would like to mention here uh, gibbous, which is because of the destruction of the vertebral body. Right. It's, an, it's a finding which you need to look for in these patients. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, um, and TB can involve a uh, lot of organs, TB, abdomen, intestine, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, there is pleural effusion. Uh, mm -hmm. which the patient can come with. Uh, TB pleural effusion is also commonly something that we can see, ocular TB, mm -hmm. uh, TB skin, mm -hmm. so genitourinary tuberculosis, adult mm -hmm. tuberculosis, so virtually almost all uh, important organs could be involved in pericardial, involved in pericardial effusion sometimes patients mm -hmm. we could diagnose as having a mm -hmm. uh, tuberculosis. So depending on which organ is involved uh, is how we go about it, mm -hmm. so but symptom wise most of these patients will have ongoing fever going on for a period of time, okay. more, more than a three, two to three weeks duration, along with a, a significant history of weight loss mm -hmm. and uh, uh, or loss of appetite. Other things uh, in history-wise would be uh, asking for a history of contact 
with the patient of tuberculosis mm -hmm. also past history of tuberculosis in this patients because that will also give additional weightage when we see this patient uh, um, uh, uh, after a period of time with these symptoms also history of other uh, immunocompromising conditions such as patient if having uh, HIV HIV because of HIV there is a resurgence of tuberculosis especially extra pulmonary tuberculosis cases are becoming more because of uh, the increase in the incidence of uh, tubercul uh, of HIV mm -hmm. so immunocompromised uh, such as uh, patient being uh, uh, uncontrolled diabetes all this could predispose again to tuberculosis so this will be more important with the history wise examination wise when we talk talk about uh, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis mm -hmm. it could come with just uh, uh, minimal uh, and the lung involvement could be just with minimal infiltrates to uh, low bar uh, consolidation yeah. findings yeah. or it could come as a pleural effusion mm -hmm. uh, as the disease progresses as Dr. Archana said cavitated lesions could occur so you mm -hmm. could get uh, uh, findings of cavity and and uh, uh, in chronic cases you can get over a period of time fibrosis and also bronchitis mm -hmm. so uh, findings related to the same we will be finding in the patient right. uh, when coming to uh, uh, extra pulmonary tuberculosis as i mentioned if it's tb uh, meningitis we'll kind of find features of uh, meningeal irritation mm -hmm. uh, also we need to look for papilledema in these patients mm -hmm. uh, to look for raised ict mm -hmm. and uh, uh, like i already mentioned spine deformity gibbous there are some external features which could indicate that the person could be having tuberculosis like iritis scleritis mm -hmm. choroid tubercle on examination of the uh, eyes and uh, um, skin there's erythema nodosum scrofulodom all those could be indirect evidence that we could be mm -hmm. looking at the case of tuberculosis right right so, I think that kind of sums up the uh, basic clinical features and history perspective. We do have a pathologist and microbiologist here, but we don't have a radiologist. So, if you imaging wise, you, you think like what are the key things probably we will be looking into if you can just. So, uh, if we is see. Is it going to help us with our diagnosis and things like that? Apical involvement is very common with tuberculosis, mainly because uh, in the apices, the mean oxygen tension is higher right. and mycobacteria needs high that high oxygen tension. Yeah. So, apical involvement seen, think more about tuberculosis, could mm -hmm. come as just some patch infiltrates in our country uh, always you know we have to think about tuberculosis are differential before we rule it out right, right. Uh, a consolidation cavity lesions cavity bronchic tases mm -hmm. so these are the main things which we'll find in x-ray pleural effusion okay okay right thanks and uh, moving on to dr archana uh, uh, something from academic interest also gaunt's complex is something which we usually ask right? can you just uh, describe on that uh, Gaunt's complex is part of primary tuberculosis and it has three components, Gaunt's focus, the lymphatics and the lymph node. Gaunt's focus is the focus in the lung which uh, usually involves the lower part of uh, upper lobe or upper part of lower lobe. Uh, as Dr. Ann said, this apical involvement usually occurs in secondary tuberculosis. This Gaunt's focus usually involves the lower part of um, upper lobe or upper part of lower lobe. And then the lymph node which drains this focus will also be involved and the lymphatics joining this uh, pulmonary focus and the lymph node is also included in the GOMS co GONS complex. So these three uh, together form the GONS complex and um, most of them they get calcified or fibrosed so they are usually asymptomatic. This is due to cell mediated immunity. Dr. Chinu, you did uh, mention about the culture as the gold standard. So, what are the newer and older kind of culture mediums? You did touch upon it, but can you just elaborate on this? Yeah. So, uh, the older ones is the uh, solid and the solid uh, what we use, LJ medium. Okay. And the newer culture method is actually the midget system, what I was talking about. Uh, so, that is a still the newer one that we consider it as the newer one. So, there is nothing much new <laughs> okay. other than that. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, Dr. Arsena, can you just uh, describe the pathological uh, description of the lesions seen in a biopsy with a uh, with tuberculosis here? So, I will start with the gross examination and then go to the microscopy. So, grossly in lung, um, as Dr. Ann said, there can be cavity. So, when we get a gross specimen of pneumonectomy, we can see a cavitatory lesion. Uh, otherwise, um, if we get a lymph node specimen, we can see the nodul nodularity. These are the uh, joining of different tubercles from this nodular appearance and the central area will have caseating necrosis. Caseating necrosis, the term stands for um, 
the caseus means cheese mm -hmm. so the center appears soft and yellowish okay. this area if you take a uh, section you can see the necrotic area mm -hmm. and um, uh, on microscopy in addition to necrosis you can see granuloma granuloma is collection of modified macrophages usually macrophage will have round to avoid nuclei mm -hmm. when they are activated they become epithelioid histiocytes the nuclei become elongated and this nuclei is known as slipper shaped nuclei mm -hmm. so collection of cells with having the slipper shaped nuclei together they form granuloma mm -hmm. and some of these macrophage coalesce together to form a giant cell so granuloma is collection of these modified macrophages with giant cell and sometimes there will be a collar of lymphocytes mm -hmm. in tuberculosis these granuloma coalesce with each other to form coalescent granuloma whereas in sarcoidosis you are, uh, you get mostly discrete granulomas so this is what we see in microscopy the granulomas with necrosis will be seen uh to dr vishnu uh, we do have a national elimination program for tuberculosis so what are the relevant things about the program which a student should be aware of yeah, yeah. so uh, <coughs> uh, basically we need to know like uh, how does this come into place like so if you talk about the national uh, program which is a public health initiative of the government of our government mm -hmm. it's it, its roots actually are back in like it'll go up to 1960s when they started off with the national tuberculosis control program oh. ntcp and then uh, later on in the 90s it became the rntcp that is a revised national tuberculosis control program where we had the dot strategy and mm -hmm. so many other things like that now this is happening because with every national program you know with the current challenges and the requirements you'll have to keep modifying all these public mm -hmm. health Uh, program so that is up to the you know based on the demands we'll have to keep modifying it so mm -hmm. at a global level uh, what happened is like uh, we had the uh, uh, stop tb strategy in like 2006 and then later on in 2014 uh, they came out with the end tb strategy mm -hmm. so in order to align our targets with the end tb strategy now we have converted our program into national tb I mean tuberculosis elimination program okay so Uh, one of the objective is obviously to try to bring down the incidence of tuberculosis and the mortality associated with it mm -hmm. uh, but along with that there are also certain other objectives like um, uh, to bring down the to prevent the emergence of like uh, resistance which is ki kind of uh, growing up right now and uh, to improve the outcome in uh, outcome of tuberculosis in like people living with hiv yeah. and also to involve the private sector so that is like something which is kind of new because okay. uh, we've come to the understanding that uh, you know we can't just completely you know stick to the government facilities and try to bring, eliminate a disease we have to have the you know support of the private systems also in place so then now we are trying to pull in you know pull in every private institutions also into the program and try to uh, control the disease mm -hmm. so uh, the basic idea is that through the program the government is able to provide all the diagnostics diagnosis and i mean uh, investigations and uh, treatment uh, free of cost to everybody in the country that is what we are trying to look for yeah and um, uh the uh, uh yeah that, that's i think that that should do yeah. about ntp i mean if i there's a lot about ntp like you know like if mm -hmm. i go in detail so uh, there are so many activities which is being done like say for example if a patient is coming for the first time being diagnosed definitely they have to be registered legally there's a mandatory requirement right now yeah and uh, so that we make sure that you know we are able to monitor them correctly and we don't miss those patients so that is quite important for us and then we also provide like as i said earlier like you know all the diagnostics and curative everything is being provided free of cost along with that we are also providing them like financial assistance and all we have the uh, nikshay portion yojana where you mm -hmm. know for nutritional support we are giving right. them 500 rupees like through direct benefit transfer and also mm -hmm. all those things are in place right now and we have a lot more in in the context of multi drug resistance also there are so many things happening right now Uh, for example bedaquilin which is kind of expensive i think is now being provided through the pro uh, program free of cost so that is like a huge thing in our country so uh, i think we are you know on the right track right now but mm -hmm. i think it will take a couple of more years to actually see the effects of whatever is being done right right okay thank you uh, dr ann uh, if you can summarize the uh, basic treatment principles in tuberculosis and also uh, what determines the duration of treatment also yeah so um, when a patient is uh, confirmed to have tuberculosis we have to initiate treatment as early as possible and already like mentioned we have to uh, register them also and um, so uh, we have to uh, as uh, dr chinu said it is uh, bacilli which divide slowly so the treatment duration is also a, a, a longer than other bacterial infections so we have to uh, tell the patient you know that uh, 
patient should be compliant with medications that is one important thing because once they start feeling better they should not discontinue the treatment because then uh, it wouldn't be fully mm -hmm. cured mm -hmm. okay so that is very very important mm -hmm. and uh, initial treatment will be first two months of uh, uh, depending on that the patient is the the what strain is got is susceptible uh, mm -hmm. to the yeah. uh, first line ATT drugs yeah. so uh, we give uh, first two months of uh, uh, isoniazid rifampicin ethambutol and pyrazinamide okay. followed by uh, another four months of uh, uh, um, HR E, which yeah. is uh, isoniazid, rifampicin and ethambutol. Right. So that is the current guidelines. Okay. So uh, during these, uh, when the patient is on treatment, patient needs to be uh, periodically reviewed. Mm -hmm. And um, should I speak about yeah, that? Please come in. Yeah. Oh. So patient needs to be periodically re reviewed because these medications, as you all now see, it is, we're giving four medi medicines together mm -hmm. in a patient. Mm -hmm. So these medications by itself have uh, some uh, um, side effects which could come in some patients which needs to be monitored and if needed modified right. and patients need to, needs to be monitored and to be looked on and so that the treatment is uh, continued and completed mm -hmm. um, uh, the government by itself is supporting in a big way uh, all these tests could be done for free even medications there are many patients who we diagnose here who we refer uh, further for dots and who complete the treatment there mm -hmm. so um, uh, cost wise now actually it's not a problem like before but even accessibility lot mm -hmm. of centers identified so usually the dot center will identify a place closest to their house mm -hmm and you know refer them there and they register there okay. so uh, shall I talk about the Please side effects yeah, also yeah. so coming to the side effects I will talk mainly of these four drugs okay. uh, most common complaint most patient complain of is nausea and vomiting initially when the initiation of the medication right. so uh, uh, according to the guidelines they say if we give it with some food or after the food or some they say even embedded within the within a banana that could help to reduce that right. another problem is uh, rash urticaria yeah, which could come with this initially we can try with antihistamines if not resolving then we'll have to see which drug probably is the cause and try to substitute with others mm -hmm. another difficult problem especially with ATT is drug induced liver injury so it right. could be just a mild increase in liver enzymes uh, transaminitis or could be uh, like you know uh, to levels which uh, which need which means that we should stop the medication for a while and then reintroduce one by one so an AST ALT level of uh, more than um, more than three is significant uh, with more symptoms than sir, more than three times yeah. sir, uh, without sim uh, with symptoms mm -hmm. and more than five without symptoms so that's the range that is given and uh, sometimes if it's just marginally increase we do still monitor them look for symptoms and give the drug and see whether it's further rising mm -hmm. so uh, there have been uh, many instances where we have had to stop the medication among these uh, when we talk about it it's mainly the pyrazinamide then INH and rifampicin which are implicated in uh, hepatotoxicity so if to stop the medications and once the liver enzymes improve then we can uh, introduce first rifampicin in a smaller dose then go up to the full dose then include uh, isoni uh, isoniazid then pyrazinamide if possible at the end or it could be substituted with the fluoroquinolone Right. Now coming uh, to um, uh, the uh, next uh, side effect, peripheral neuropathy is very common, especially when we're using uh, INH. Right. So that can be compacted by using, uh, we have to give pyro pyrid uh, pyridoxin along with this B6. Mm -hmm. That helps to uh, helps in this. And uh, ethambutol main concerns is in patients with, uh, uh, we need to monitor their vision. Right. So they could have a uh, 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 color vision uh, difficulties as mm -hmm. well as development of optic neuritis so they need to be periodically checked and if it is there we need to discontinue the medication mm -hmm. so i've uh, uh, gone with the side effects mainly with these even uh, in nephrotoxicity in patients with kidney disease we adjust the dose of mm -hmm. ethambutol okay. so i've uh, restricted if we go on i can go on yeah. with the second line but yeah. i Fine. presently would uh, want to stop. and uh, regarding the duration also though the conventional thing is for six months is uh, yes gonna remain uh, in special uh, instances like in, in cns tuberculosis um, in bone tuberculosis joints um, uh, we need to continue a treatment for more than six months uh, even up to a year and then we need to image them look for resolution looks for improvement and sometimes there have been 
instances where we have need to needed to even continue treatment beyond that mm-hmm. uh, one year depending on uh, uh, the improvement so usually sometimes we'll have to even continue beyond that 6 months even up to a year so do you usually uh, test them again or how i mean so uh, uh, before the completion of treatment we do uh, at two months only actually we we do do a sputum afp and uh, confirm that the patient has become negative and also uh, the chest x ray we look for resolution and uh, even other uh, extra pulmonary tuberculosis we do uh, serially look whether the pleural effusion is usually resolved by that time not resolving obviously we need to look for as to why resistance or what could be the problem or is it compliance with medication so whether they miss medications mm-hmm. many a times because of side effects such as nausea vomiting some patients tend to miss medications they don't come to us also uh, in they come after a while they might have discontinued for a short while then restarted so that means you need to really give that amount of time extra mm-hmm. uh, uh, cns tuberculosis we do image and see whether there is resolution of these okay. uh, earlier findings right Okay. Well, Vishnu, uh, uh, from a global perspective, you see there are a lot of regimes and mm. protocols and things. Like, uh, uh, can you just uh, kindly c- consider touching upon the various regimes and also what is this concept of FDCs in uh, tuberculosis so, treatment? Uh, like, in, I mean, contrary to the previous guidelines and all, like where we had like multiple categories and all, now we we don't. It's not at all complex. It's yeah. like quite easy right now. Yeah. Uh, we just have like two groups to treat one is the people with drug sensitivity to yeah. tb and the drug resistant to tb group that is how we classify them right now mm-hmm. and uh, to the sensitive group as madam was telling we go for the uh, you know for all the all the new patients all new cases and the previous cases we treat them with the uh, f- the fixed dose combinations right now okay. and uh, like like we have like again intensive phase and continuation phases there and then the intensive phases for like 2 months and the continuation phases for like 4 months mm-hmm. uh, as madam said like for the intensive phase we have uh, isoniazidrofampicin pyrazinamide and ethambutol and uh, the continuation phase we have hre over there uh, so that is how it goes for the the drug resistant cases uh, we have like second line uh, anti tubercular drugs are there and again the duration everything will become a little bit more complex towards uh, that side over there now uh, talking about the fixed drug uh, combination i mean fixed dose combinations actually i think that is like a very big advantage what we have right now because uh, what do you mean by fdc is basically when you have like one drug which has more than two active you know more than two drugs uh, put into one tablet over there so we have like one single tablet with all the drugs so instead of giving like one uh, medication for pyrazinamide one for rifampicin one for ethambutol we now have like one tablet with everything together so and we just have to give the you know tablets according to the weight band so we have like multiple weight bands and based on the patient's weight we can actually just titrate and give like the number of tablets like we can give like two tablets or maybe three tablets or four tablets based on the weight of the patient right. one advantage what happens here is that you know we are trying to you know improve the patient compliance here because imagine if you have like some so many medications what happens is in the end people might skip a few medications so this is commonly seen like if like um, like madam you must be seeing like in patients like people with diabetes and cad and hypertension and everything they'll have like some 10 15 medications and then when you start talking to them they'll be like you know i did not take my hypertensive medication because it got over or maybe i forgot about that or this thing so then there is a lot of irregularity now we can't afford that sort of an irregularity in the context of tuberculosis because right. we have to treat them mandatorily and we have to make sure that they take these medications correctly so in order to you know make it more easier this fdc helps a lot because it's much more easier for the patient patient compliance is, is improved drastically and uh, another major thing is like because uh, we have brought down monotherapy the uh, the the emergence of resistance is also now coming down mm-hmm. and i think that is one major reason where we are where we are looking for like to bring down resistance i think this is a, this has played a huge role i believe i mean uh, must be i mean i think that is uh, one of the reasons i believe so um, I think I think that should be yeah. about FDCs. I mean, like, like that. Okay, thank you. Coming back to Dr. Arshina, uh, I mean, uh, can you share the insights about the pathogenesis behind miliary tuberculosis? Yeah. Um, miliary tuberculosis occurs due to hematogenous spread, and it can occur from primary progressive primary tuberculosis or progressive secondary tuberculosis, and it can involve liver, spleen, kidney, um, uh, adrenal. in meninges any organ virtually can be affected right. and uh, when you see these uh, organs you can see tiny 2 mm sized yellowish nodules and uh, they are res- they resemble the millet seed 
that's why the term mediary tb has come up so um, the pathogenesis is mainly by hematogenous spread and it can involve most of the organs uh, dr sena in your initial uh, uh, talk itself you did mention about the uh, drug sensitivity testing but now can you just elaborate on that uh, okay yeah. so to identify whether um, the anti tubercular drugs are resistant on or not we have broadly classified them as two methods one is the phenotypic method and the other one is the genotypic method okay so phenotypic as the name suggests we are phenotypically looking whether that uh, bacteria or bacilli is resistant to a particular drugs mm-hmm. so we culture the bacteria in these mj tubes or lj tubes which contain uh, the concentration of a uh, concentration of each drug mm-hmm. so you have multiple tubes which contain multiple drugs in different concent- or in a single concentration and then you inoculate the bacteria and then you incubate and then you look whether the bacteria is go- growing in the presence of these drugs so if they are growing in the presence of these drugs we say that the bacteria is resistant to that particular drug so if in the rifampicin containing lj medium or mj tube there is growth we say that rifampicin is resistant here right. but the problem is it takes a long period of time again mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. takes some 6 uh, to 4 8 weeks for them so we do not perform them and it is very difficult because mm-hmm. uh, of the resource uh, limitations also mm-hmm. these drugs are not that easily available and they it's difficult to incorporate them in the media mm-hmm. so we prefer molecular or the uh, genotypic methods as the name suggests we are looking for the resistant genes in mm-hmm. these bacteria okay. so gene expert uh, is the ma- major uh, platform okay. so here uh, initially Uh, the gene expert platform would tell you whether rifampicin resistant is there or not mm-hmm. but nowadays since the presence of mdr and pre xtr and xtr tbs are in the rice mm-hmm. so they have also introduced various uh, genes that okay. uh, will, will tell you whether xtr the other members of the anti tubercular drugs are resistant or not and then you also have line pro base okay they will also tell you whether there is resistance for the first line as well as second line drugs now uh, the more Uh, recent one is the whole genome sequencing right so it is uh, when compared to pcr it is more expensive because as the name suggests we are sequencing the entire genome of the bacteria so it is going to be very expensive but it is going to tell you all the possible mutations that you see in that bacteria right. to all the drugs so that is the advantage of it thank you so since we are talking about mdr tb dr vishnu if you can just give a problem statement and also like, like is there any schemes kind of focusing on mdr tb from the government so uh, when you talk about mdr tb that as i said earlier it's like a growing threat right now globally and at a national level i mean mm-hmm. if you look at the uh, rates i mean i think last year or something i think the rates was like uh, of all the new cases detected almost 3 percentage were mdr tb globally in, in right. india with a recent study they sh- they said like of all the new cases almost 6 percentage were Uh, resistant cases so that is like a problem for us mm-hmm. uh, i mean uh, see these are all things which can be prevented if we follow the right kind of as it is tuberculosis everything all the preventive mechanism everything preventive measures you take are something similar to the pandemic like covid what we saw like mm-hmm. you know maybe cough a ticket and <laughs> hand washing and all that but at that point of time people did follow it religiously because the scare was probably real people did see people you know ending up in icus right, and right. you know ventilators and all that and here also but here somehow people don't get the real picture because they don't see people with mdr tb you know you don't see them quite often but the problem is it's much more difficult to treat because mm-hmm. you have like expensive medications it's going to take a longer time it gets even more complex so uh, but uh, so i think we need to we need you know we need to put our foot down and like you know make sure that you know we do activities Uh, or public health i mean you know maybe um, um, uh, spend more on iec activities or get the people aware about more about th- the actual problem what we are facing right now uh, from the uh, from the program wise i think for mdr tb what uh, one thing what is happening is like as i said earlier the betaquilin and everything is being provided free of cost and second thing is like it is the government is ma- mandatorily asked to uh, go for drug sensitivity testing every time you test a patient so initially you just did a, a sputum this thing and all but now they are actually doing a dst uh, to ensure that no resistance cases are being missed right now mm-hmm. and if you pick a patient with a resistant who is resistant to this thing i mean who who has like mdr this thing and then you normally what you do is you refer them to the uh, uh, district uh, drug resistant treatment center and they take over from there i believe so uh, then you know they do their in set of investigations and all the medications and everything is being 
uh, followed up from their side so the drtc is there which is uh, which is kind of helping us right now and uh, to support them we also have the difficult to treat tb clinics right now in place so that clinic that sort of a thing also kind of supports these drtcs in managing the mdr tbs in mm-hmm. mdr tb patients in our country and uh, those are the major things and uh, the all the other things like which are given to the the other tb patients are also coming over here like for example the nikshay portion yojana which i said earlier the mm-hmm. financial assistance everything is being given to these patients as well mm-hmm. so i think that are the kind of sums it up for the mdr people mm-hmm. right thank you uh, to dr ann um, i mean uh, tb meningitis comes with its own kind of challenges right so if you can just share some insights about tb meningitis and also is there any uh, like uh, specific care we need to consider specific aspects in immunocompromised patients if at all yeah so uh, just before i start one more thing i wanted to mention is uh, when we start att always we have to uh, tell the patient that the uh, rifampicin is going to cha- uh, change the color of their urine yeah, and right, body right. fluids it's very important actually because sometimes patients if you have not counseled might think that as a significant side effect and even discontinue medication right. so that is one important mm-hmm. point there coming to tb meningitis per se it is uh, it is a uh, it is a big concern especially when patients uh, come to us as i told you earlier the symptoms usually they come with is uh, headache vomiting um visual abnormalities altered sensorium and uh, uh, when we examine them um, they will be having uh, uh, the sensorium will be altered low gcs um, sometimes um, um, on examination we can get papilledema uh, the uh, the uh, signs of meningitis will be uh, positive and uh, in these patients uh, uh, we need to uh, do uh, imaging as early as possible and uh, in tuberculosis uh, tb meningitis mainly affects the more basal areas and uh, could come with associated other features also it could uh, involve o- o- uh, the cranial nerves especially the ocular ones and um, also um, uh there could be um a lot of exudates which can uh, come over there and can lead to a lot of complications so it's very important that uh, it needs to be diagnosed at the earliest and treatment initiated so uh imaging what could be seen as features of this meningitis mainly in the basal areas there could be uh, tuberculomas which could be found on the uh, on the mri uh they it could present uh, not only meningitis other i'm telling right, cns right. findings yeah. can come as like an abscess okay. arachnoiditis all these are other features so when we suspect uh, tb meningitis uh, another investigation is very relevant for us is a lumbar puncture test so um, uh, we find that uh, the csf will be cloudy and uh, uh, there will be increase in cells predominantly the lymphocyte counts will be predominantly increased and when we look at the uh, the glucose and protein protein will be significantly elevated and uh, a glucose will be reduced right uh, also uh, we can send the csf sample as dr chino said for other test tb culture very important and other uh, the r pcr tests uh, the gene expert and uh, also afp smear so uh, the usually it is difficult to identify this but we we've, we've had instances where we get the gene expert positive culture and uh, afp smear not so commonly got but gene expert positivity helps us to clinch the diagnosis and mm-hmm. uh, initiate treatment mm-hmm. so when we talk about treatment along with the att we have to start steroids also in these patients right. uh, to prevent complications and additions and uh, reduce the exudates so steroids usually at a dose of 0.4 Uh, mg per kg per day uh, for the first week and then 0.1 mg reduced every week then changed to oral and gradually tapered and stopped so that uh, uh, usually in patients once we initiate treatment the symptoms gradually improve and uh, 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 we are able to you know complete treatment but uh, like uh, uh, saying because of the resistance we do have in between some patients who come like that it's very difficult to treat them actually and even uh, you know uh, longer duration of medications and side effects are more so it is going to be a challenge you know uh, so it is very important that we take uh, the necessary uh, measures to contain tb okay 
thank you uh, with that we have uh, kind of exhausted all the pre planned questions uh, but one common question to uh, all of you so from an undergraduate perspective like what are the questions they have to expect for an exam for the topic of tuberculosis and if at all we have missed any anything in this topic kindly elaborate on that yeah so we have covered most of the important questions for tuberculosis at undergraduate level and you can also refer to the illustration given in robins for studying the pathogenesis so uh, while i was explaining the um, uh, pathogenesis you can also refer to the image so that it will be easier for you to understand and then for uh, practical examination you will have gross specimen viva for that there will be a tb lymph node or a tb lung where there will be cavity or a node with necrosis so that can be there for your exam and for microscopy spotter a granuloma with necrosis can be a spotter on microscopy so this can be there for practical exam uh, yeah so i think uh, when you answer answer anything in like in community medicine what we normally tell is like go for the epidemiological triad so i would suggest when you start writing you you know you mention all those things like what is the agent what is the host what is the environment because these are the things which is which what is actually creating the disease in the first place so put that over there it will be helpful for you to actually start answering those questions as well i mean not only for tb even if it does any other condition if you start solving all those things it will be kind of um, i usually tell that in the class as well so i think that is one thing which i would like to add here and secondly as i said over here the category and i think those are all um, quite uh, like common viva questions usually being asked so that is actually important and uh, when it comes to mdr tb also whatever we discussed over here like uh, you know uh, like how what are the schemes being provided and especially in ntp and all that so that is those are all common questions and whenever you start writing i would also ask you to write the epidemiology part as well like the problem statement like what are we looking at right now what is the current scenario and uh, where are we going and while ending the answer whatever it is uh, try to put in a conclusion maybe like one or two lines from your side like what do you think about the situation like your own point there's nothing right or wrong there what do you think based on what you wrote or what you know about this i mean about the disease or the program is there anything you can change over there so just you know start using you know just think about it maybe one or two points might help you know those that will i think that will put a public health perspective clear in the answer i think so thank you dr ann so when we talk from the medicine perspective any of these questions <laughs> can come for you all uh -huh. so you'll have to know tb inside out it's one of the like already mentioned it is one of the biggest problem that uh, among the infectious diseases that we face so questions starting from pathogenesis microbiology newer tests uh, ntp all these aspects medication side effects uh, treatment extra pulmonary tuberculosis even when it, when it comes to practicals uh, uh, like tb proliferation are very commonly kept extra pulmonary tuberculosis mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so uh, open tb unlikely but mm -hmm. after duration of treatment <laughs> might be but uh, uh, it is something that we will see a lot in our uh, in our practice also so it is uh, something that you will have for sure in your exam paper for us laboratory diagnosis is quite important mm -hmm. so in the laboratory diagnosis i want them to write about molecular methods also mm -hmm. then uh, this smear afb stain is actually a practical exam for them okay. so they have to perform the stain then grade the smear and write their report and then uh, during the practical viva anything based on tb can also be asked so that is also there right okay uh thank you all for for this very very uh informative discussion and i'm sure the students would have uh, noted down the key points here and thank you all